good afternoon. My name is Immaculata DeVivo, and I am the interim uh, co-director for science programming for academic uh, adventures at Radcliffe Institute. So Radcliffe Institute um, is comprised of three large programs. There's the Schlesinger Library. There's a very prestigious Radcliffe Fellows. Thank you to any of the fellows who are here today. And then, of course, Academic Ventures, which um, Rebecca Wasserman is the executive director, and um, Sean O'Donnell uh, also um, is part of the Academic Ventures. And under Academic Ventures, they are the ones who are actually sponsoring this Next in Science. It is a uh, very innovative uh, programming that brings in lots of diversity with respect to um, humanities, science, art, and predicated on that are all of the programming. So Academic Ventures, in addition to the Next in Science series, also sponsors these exploratory seminars and accelerated workshops. These are funding opportunities uh, to bring in, again, a very uh, multidisciplinary team to ask the big questions, to have to brainstorm, essentially. And they are... Um, submitted by a Harvard faculty or a Radcliffe Fellow or a prior Radcliffe Fellow, but you can go to the website to get more information. In addition to these uh, symposiums and workshops, Academic uh, Ventures sponsors these uh, very large uh, symposiums, the very successful Undiscovered on October 26th, and uh, there, was such, there was such great buzz about that that we're continuing uh, to run series from that uh, Undiscovered. They also uh, sponsor exhibits, uh, like the measured um, exhibit on Thursday, and of course, the Next in Science series, which is what I'm gonna briefly uh, tell you about today. But more importantly, the, the, uh, the richness of academic ventures is to open up these incredible uh, symposiums and lectures and events to the public, so we can all be enriched um, by the events. So the Next in Science is really an opportunity for early career scientists, the rising rock stars. And we bring them together. Uh, they have overlapping research interests. And they not only meet each other, but they meet all of you and exchange ideas uh, to the Harvard-wide, campus-wide, Boston-wide. And today's uh, Next in Science idea came from this understanding of evolution. Most people think we're done with evolution. But really, we're not. So we have the, the past, the current, and what is the future of evolution? And the four uh, bright stars today uh, will address some of those um, questions. So the focus is on evolution, and I don't want to take uh, too much time. But just uh, the overview is that we will start with uh, Neanderthal human integration, and then we'll move on to uh, human migration and the impact of um, uh, environment and just change, how, that, uh, how natural selection works with respect to disease and other traits. And then we'll have a break, and we'll have two other, the two speakers in the after, uh, later afternoon will speak about uh, rapid evolution in fish, and then um, a last speaker will speak about uh, urban evolution as um, measured with the white clover, a plant, which everyone has in their garden. I can guarantee you whether you want it or not. So with that, I would like to introduce our very first speaker, Sharam Shakaraman. He is an assistant professor in the Department of Computer Science at the um, Human Genetics at UCLA. And his interest is the interface of computer science, statistics, and biology. He's pretty much the, the genomicist uh, that we are very familiar with. They um, give us lots of data um, on a lot of different uh, aspects of uh, biology. But uh, I was intrigued by Sharam when his paper on the Neanderthal integration with humans, and that's what he's going to talk about today, Archaic Admixture in Human History. So, Sharam? All right. Um, firstly, I'd like to say uh, I'm really excited. Uh, this is a great uh, meeting, and I'm looking forward to interacting with you and, and uh, 
and learning about everybody's work. Um, what I'm going to talk about today um, is basically to give you an idea of this revolution in our understanding of human evolution that's been enabled by the fact that we can now get DNA out of ancient individuals. So specifically, uh, I'm going to talk about the fact that we have genome sequences from archaic populations. By that, we mean populations like the Neanderthals, which are closely related to modern humans, but not quite modern human. And given the genomes of these archaic populations, we'd like to understand the relationships between archaic and modern humans. So specifically, we're going to talk about intermixing or admixture between archaic and modern humans. And what I'd like to give you a feel for is how do we actually learn about this given genomic data? And given that we've learned about it, what are kind of the consequences of this archaic admixture for human evolution and human biology? So by looking at genomes from present-day humans, we have acquired a broad outline of human evolution or human history over the last couple of hundred thousand years. So we know that modern humans evolved in Africa, and about 100,000 years ago, there was a migration or exit out of Africa. All populations outside of Africa trace their ancestry to this small subset that exited Africa. Now, there's a wrinkle to the story, and that comes from the fact that as this population left Africa, there was another population in much of Europe and Central Asia, the Neanderthals. And so the Neanderthals were in this geographic range from about 300,000 years till about 30,000 years when they disappear from the fossil record. So there's a lot of debate, there was a lot of debate, there continues to be a lot of debate about the interaction between these two populations. Did these two populations meet? Was there interbreeding? So one major step in trying to understand this relationship came with the sequencing of the first Neanderthal genome. So this was the cave in Croatia from which the bones that yielded the first draft Neanderthal genome were obtained. And given this first draft Neanderthal genome, it made sense to look at this question of interbreeding. And so the question or the statistical test that was asked was, if you take a Neanderthal genome and compare it to the genomes of two modern human individuals, for example, if you look at an African genome and a non-African genome, is the Neanderthal genome closer to one relative to the other? And what was observed in this initial study was non-Africans as a whole tend to be genetically closer to Neanderthals relative to Africans. So this observation is consistent with a history where there was interbreeding between Neanderthals and non-Africans after non-Africans split from Africans. In other words, there was this population that left Africa, and before the dispersal into the different non-African populations, they met and interbred with Neanderthals. So given that this was a plausible history, a question is, can we come up with estimates of when this admixture might have happened? So to do this, we use the fact that when genomes are transmitted from parents to offspring, there's a process called recombination, which shuffles up the genome that gets transmitted. So for example, in this cartoon, you have a modern human and an archaic, and the offspring, for example, this individual, inherits one genome from the archaic parent and the other from the modern human parent. But in the next generation, the offspring is going to have a mosaic and that's because of this recombination that ends up shuffling the genome that gets transmitted. And this happens after every generation, so that when you look at an individual, say, 50,000 years later, this individual's genome is going to have this mosaic pattern with the modern human chunks interspersed with the archaic chunks. And roughly, the length of these segments is indicative of the time of admixture. So the greater the time since admixture, the shorter the chunks. So by looking at the length of the chunks of Neanderthal DNA that are present in non-African genomes, we were able to say that the date of interbreeding between Neanderthals and modern humans is roughly about 50,000 years before present. So this is consistent with what we know about the Out of Africa event. So the Out of Africa event being dated to about 100,000 years, so this is consistent with introgression into the non-Africans 
after they left Africa. We can also use other kinds of statistical techniques to estimate what fraction of the non-Africans' ancestry traces to Neanderthals. And our current estimate is about 2% of the ancestry of non-African populations traces back to Neanderthals. So with this, we have what I would think of as a global picture of the relationship between modern humans and Neanderthals. We think that humans and Neanderthals split about of the order of 300,000 years in the past. And then Africans and non-Africans split about 100,000 years ago, followed by interbreeding between Neanderthals into the ancestors of non-Africans. So this gives us a global picture. And the implication is, if you look at non-African genomes today, they're going to be carrying these chunks of Neanderthal DNA, these chunks that are actually quite distinct and diverged from the rest of the DNA that's floating around. So this begs the question, what was the effect of this highly distinctive DNA that's embedded within the modern human gene pool? Does it have a functional impact, or is it just random bits of DNA floating around? So here's one example of a concrete uh, impact of some of this Neanderthal DNA. So this was a study that happened uh, four years back, which was a scan for genes that are associated with type 2 diabetes risk. And this scan turned up a particular gene. And it turns out that the risk variant in this particular gene has a very specific and interesting geographic distribution. So the risk variant is found mostly in the Americas at high frequencies. It's quite rare outside of America, maybe at lower frequencies in Europe, but essentially absent in Africa. So this is exactly the kind of distribution you would expect if this risk variant was introduced into the modern human gene pool through interbreeding with Neanderthals. Now it turns out, if you do some additional analysis, this risk variant can be shown to actually have Neanderthal origins. So this was one specific example, one gene, that we traced back to Neanderthal interbreeding. The question is, what can we say about the rest of the genome? Can we systematically go and label individuals' genomes and try to identify the origins of Neanderthal DNA within individual genomes. So what we need to do is we need to build what we call a map of Neanderthal ancestry. What we mean by that is, if you look at a present-day non-African individual, the genome has this mosaic pattern. There are these red chunks of Neanderthal DNA floating around in the rest of their genome. And we'd like to be able to identify what these red chunks are. And so we built a statistical method that actually goes and fishes for these chunks in a modern human genome. The basic idea is that it looks at the modern human genome and compares it to a Neanderthal as well as to an African genome. The African genomes don't have Neanderthal DNA. So by doing this comparison, we can try to identify places which are likely to be of Neanderthal origin. And what we get from this kind of a statistical model looks like this. So what we are looking at here are places along the genome. And we are looking at places where the model says it's highly confident that there is Neanderthal DNA. So that's what these spikes denote. And what we are seeing here is when we look at genomes of a European American or an East Asian, there are a number of regions along the genome where the model is highly confident of Neanderthal DNA. However, when we apply it to an African genome, there are relatively few such regions. So this is telling us that the model is doing something reasonable, that it's actually consistent with our knowledge of history. So using this technique, we can build what we term population maps of Neanderthal ancestry. In other words, we can go to a given population, say European genomes, and for every region, we can ask what percentage of individuals carry Neanderthal DNA at this region. And so you're sliding along the genome of these individuals, and you're building these maps which tell you, in this position, many European individuals carry Neanderthal DNA, whereas in this region, relatively few do. And so what I'm showing here is this map of Neanderthal ancestry for European populations and East Asian populations. So what is interesting about this map 
is this rapid variation in Neanderthal DNA as you move along the genome. There are places where there is a lot of Neanderthal DNA concentrated, what we term as peaks of Neanderthal ancestry. And then there are places where essentially there is no Neanderthal DNA across these populations, what we term as deserts. So it's interesting to understand what might be causing this variation in Neanderthal ancestry. Is this a, just a random occurrence? Or is there some biology? Is there some selective advantage for some regions to be peaks and others to be deserts? So here is one extreme example of a peak of Neanderthal DNA. So this is a place in the genome where more than half of Europeans carry the Neanderthal version of the gene. So to give you a sense of this, today more than half Europeans carry the Neanderthal version of the gene. 50,000 years ago, it was about 2%. So this is a place where the frequency of the Neanderthal DNA has risen over the last 50,000 years. And so there are several such regions in the genome which are peaks of Neanderthal DNA and which we can strongly say are places where the Neanderthal DNA has risen up in frequency, not by chance, but because it must have had an adaptive impact. It was beneficial once it entered the modern human gene pool, and that's why it rose up in frequency. We can then ask, what might be the functional impact of these peaks of Neanderthal DNA? Were there specific kinds of functions that they were associated with? And in fact, there are several kinds of functions that we associate with these peaks. For example, we find that many of these peaks of Neanderthal DNA are associated with skin and hair-related function. So the suggestion here is that the reason why this Neanderthal DNA rose up in frequency was because they affected skin and hair biology, and that might have been adaptively beneficial because Neanderthals were already in the environments into which modern humans were then expanding. So borrowing these this DNA from Neanderthals was a quick way for modern humans to adapt to these new kinds of environments. So now we can turn our attention to the deserts of Neanderthal DNA. So these are large places in the genome, several million bases long, where essentially nobody seems to be carrying Neanderthal DNA. That's quite surprising. And the question is, is it because of the fact that these places are resistant to Neanderthal DNA? Is it driven because of the fact that these places are functionally important for humans? So these are places which are preserving some kind of human function, and that is why the Neanderthal DNA is being resisted and removed. So here is one such striking example of a desert. It's a desert in every population we've looked at. It's a desert in Europeans and in East Asians. And this desert overlaps a famous gene called FOXP2. And this region, this gene is interesting because it's been shown to be involved in speech and language. So a hypothesis is that potentially there is some function conferred around this region that is important for modern humans. And that is why this is resistant to the Neanderthal version of the DNA. So to look at this a little bit more quantitatively, we looked at different places in the genome, and we bin them according to how constrained they are by selection. So there are places in the genome which are very constrained, where there is no toleration for new kinds of mutations, and those are on the left. And then there are places which are more relaxed on the right. And what we see is both in Europeans and East Asians, as you move towards regions with a strongly constrained, there's a reduction in the amount of Neanderthal ancestry or the Neanderthal DNA. So this is telling us overall, the genome is purifying away most of the Neanderthal ancestry. So the Neanderthal ancestry on average tends to be deleterious. So even though there are peaks of Neanderthal DNA which are beneficial, the big picture is the Neanderthal DNA is deleterious. So one question is what causes this? And there are still several models out there. One model is, the story is Neanderthals had a very small population size over a long period of time. So they accumulated lots of deleterious mutations, bad mutations. And these came into the human population through the admixture, and they were quickly removed from the human population. So that's one model to try to explain this kind of impact of Neanderthal ancestry. There's a second model, and this comes out of what we know about how species form. 
So for example, when you have two populations that split and evolve and become two species, there's a question of what is driving this formation of species. And so this is a model called a hybrid sterility model. The idea is these populations accumulate mutations, which do just fine as long as they're isolated. But the moment they come back together and they mix, these mutations tend to be bad. So for example, the Neanderthals accumulated some mutations, they came into the human gene pool, and they have interactions that causes them to be removed. It turns out this model makes two kinds of predictions. One is, if you look at the X chromosome, one of the sex chromosomes, and compare it to the rest of the genome, the effects of Neanderthal DNA getting purged will be much more stronger on the X chromosome compared to the rest of the genome. And that's indeed what we see, where the X chromosome has substantially reduced Neanderthal DNA compared to the autosomes in the Europeans and East Asians. There's a second prediction from this model, which is the effects of this kind of a model would be substantial on genes which are highly expressed in the testes. And what we find is when you look at testes genes, again, there is a substantial depletion in Neanderthal DNA. So it's plausible that there are both kinds of models, both the hybrid sterility model, as well as this model where there is reduced population sizes in the Neanderthals, contributing to their DNA being bad and being removed from the human gene pool. So, so far I've talked only about the Neanderthal population, but what's emerged in the last several years is this discovery of a second archaic population, which is a cousin of the Neanderthals. So this population is called the Denisovans, and this is a notable population because its discovery came mainly from genetics. So there was no prior fossil evidence suggesting the existence of this population. So after the Denisovan genome was sequenced, again, there was a question, has there been intermixing or admixture between the Denisovans and certain human populations? And what was discovered was that populations in Oceania today, present-day Oceania, so these are populations like the Papuans, Aboriginal Australians, have admixture from the Denisovan population. So Oceanian populations have both Neanderthal DNA as well as Denisovan DNA. Like we did for the Neanderthals, we can also try to figure out the date of this interbreeding event. And by looking at the lengths of the Denisovan DNA that's segregating in the Oceanians, we estimate this to be around 45,000 years ago. So this was after the Neanderthal interbreeding event. Again, we can build maps of Denisovan DNA around the world. So here I'm showing you the results of looking at a worldwide population. And every dot here is a population, and the color is telling you how much Denisovan DNA is there in this population across their genome. So we see this red spot here. Those are the Oceanians, so they have substantially higher Denisovan DNA. But then you see this smear of green in a set of other populations. So East Asian populations, South Asian populations also have a small but non-negligible proportion of Denisovan DNA. So what this spread is telling us is this Denisovan population, which we don't have as much fossil evidence about, we only know it from the genetics, could potentially have had a wide geographic range. And we also have evidence that there was multiple mixing events involving Denisovans and modern human population groups. We can also build maps along the genome, looking at where is this Denisovan DNA distributed. So we can build like maps of Denisovan and Neanderthal DNA and compare them. And again, we see a very similar picture of peaks and deserts of Denisovan and Neanderthal DNA. So there are regions like this that also include the FOXP2 gene, which are deserts of both Denisovan and Neanderthal DNA. And then there are peaks of Denisovan DNA, the most notable one, this amazing story in Tibetans, focuses on a gene called EPAS1. And this is a gene where there is a high proportion of Denisovan DNA in Tibetans, and that has been useful in adaptation to high altitude environments. So it's a clear example of this archaic DNA being useful in human adaptation. So finally, we can again ask, is the Denisovan DNA like the Neanderthal DNA deleterious on average? 
And again, when we look at the genome, as we move towards highly constrained regions of the genome, like the Neanderthal DNA, the Denisovans are also purged in this highly selectively constrained regions of the genome. So what it's telling us is archaic DNA, both Neanderthal and Denisovan, on the whole seems to have had very similar effects. On average, it, it was bad, but there were places where they could have actually provided an evolutionary advantage. So just to summarize, I think the key message that I want to say is ancient DNA is this amazing new technology that's giving us a new way to ask questions about human evolution. I've mainly focused on archaic genomes, genomes from Neanderthals and Denisovans, but there are now hundreds, maybe thousands of genomes from what we call ancient modern humans, people who lived in the last 10,000 years, and that's giving us new insights into very recent human evolution. So using these archaic genomes, we were able to build maps of Neanderthal and Denisovan ancestry across populations. And the key picture that's coming out of this is the complexity of the interactions of Neanderthals, Denisovans, and modern humans. It's not just one interbreeding event. There are multiple interbreeding events separated across space and time. The other interesting idea is you can think of using this introgression or interbreeding as a tool to understand human evolution and human biology. And I think that's going to be powerful and something that's uh, worth thinking more deeply about. With this, I'd like to thank everyone. I'd like to thank the mem members of the Neanderthal Genome Analysis Consortium. This is where all of this work began. Um, and I'd like to thank all my funding sources. Thank you. Thank you, Sharon. That was great. So we only have about five minutes of questions right now. Okay. Yes. Can you yes. please state your name? Uh, and question? Yes. Can you give me a number of, about uh, how long a segment of Neanderthal DNA would be inside me or in a random Homo sapiens? Are we talking 50 bases or 50,000 bases? And how, how many of them are there? Right. So the question is how many... Uh, how long are these segments of Neanderthal DNA? So based on these time estimates of around 50,000 years, on average, these, uh, these segments are of the order of 50,000 bases. Um, so that's kind of the average length, although there is a lot of variation. There can be extremely lo long and extremely short segments. In terms of numbers, it's, uh, I don't have a, 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 a specific number to quote because it depends on which individual genome you're looking at, different individuals will be carrying different subsets of Neanderthal DNA. Thank you. Hi, I'm Heather Remoff, um, bit can you, of a fanciful. Can you please talk into yeah, the Yeah, I'm mic. Heather Remoff, and this is a bit of a fanciful question, but I'm thinking of the traits both where their concentration, uh, traits relating to skin and hair, and those where there's a desert with the fox P2, is that what it is, relating to language? And it seems to me that those are things that would express themselves both by looking at an individual and behaviorally in terms of the speech. Do you consider at all whether in addition to natural selection, some sexual selection is coming into play here? Um. Absolutely. I don't think we can differentiate uh, whether this was sexual versus natural selection. I think the effects of either of those modes of selection are going to be quite similar. So it is entirely possible. Um, and it's entirely possible, for example, that there were different mating systems across these populations, and that uh, plays into how selection uh, functions. Um, so it's, 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 it's very plausible. I don't think we can differentiate those two scenarios here. Yeah. Thank you. Hi. I noted that your distribution of genome types did not include any symbols in Africa. So I thought there was evidence that there was re certain people returning from Europe to Africa. But of course, over the last thousand years, this would have been entirely mixed. So I was wondering if there was evidence from uh, samples of more than a thousand years old of, the, of whether there was, for example, any Neanderthal DNA introduced into Africa. Right. So the question is whether there is evidence for Neanderthal DNA in any African population. Um, we do see traces of Neanderthal DNA in some African populations. 
Um, we think that most of that is explained by back migration from some of these uh, out of Africa populations back into Africa. Um, the traces are quite small. So you could imagine if an out of African population carries 2% DNA and 2% of them come back, that's gonna be maybe four parts in, a, in, in, a, in 10,000. So there's a, there's a trace amount that is detectable, um, mostly explainable by these kinds of back migration events. This will be the last question for this. Oh, well, yeah. <clears throat> well, it'll be a high point, I hope, for the break. Uh, so There's I'm Ed Hart, Harvard, later. 59, recently retired pediatric neurologist and former redhead. And I read somewhere that only 2 or 3% of the population in the world is redheaded and that they trace it to the Neanderthal genes. Is that the BNC2 gene? And is that something that's on my genome that could be found? Or is that a so bit of a stretch? So the question is, you're asking about a specific gene being uh, Apparently, this is what I read, that redheadedness is traceable to the Neanderthal population, and it's only 2 or 3% of the world's population. And I wondered, you mentioned that, uh, I think it was BNC2 gene, was related to hair color, and I just wondered if that was the gene, or is there a gene for redheadedness? Um, I'll probably leave it at that. Yeah, I, I, I couldn't catch the name of the gene, so I'm not, I'm, um, maybe we should take it offline. because Sure, we can do that yeah. offline. We'll have a break later, and we can talk offline. Okay, Shreem, that was fantastic. I didn't even get to ask a question, so I'll have to wait. I have a big question for you later. Okay, so with that... Thank you.